Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Brilliant. When I made my video about the Narnia franchise a few weeks ago, one thing I was really struck by in the comments was just how many people said things like, well, at least it's not Aragon. A film that seems to be almost universally disliked from what I can tell. I honestly hadn't thought about Aragon in a long time, and I definitely hadn't revisited the 2006 movie since it was released in theaters. Which, on at least some level, is kind of surprising, because at one point, Aragon was one of my favorite books I'd ever read. It was a novel that meant a lot to me, both because it was so accessible and exciting to 12-year-old readers, but also because its author was a teenage homeschooled kid from Montana, and I was also a homeschooled kid from Montana. Add to that the fact that I was a big Lord of the Rings fan, and it was hard to imagine a book that felt more pitched to me specifically. So of course, I was hugely excited for the movie. Now this was before I was on the internet much, but I remember trying to get my hands on any scrap of news about the project in magazines like Empire and Entertainment Weekly. I remember I saved up money to buy the PS2 tie-in game that came out a month before the film. Like I was off the charts excited for this thing. Then the movie actually came out. I saw it once, I remember being crushed by how it completely failed to live up to my expectations, but then I just kind of rarely thought about it again. That is, until I started working on this video. I wanted to, after all these years, finally try to pinpoint what left me, and so many other fans, feeling disappointed back in 2006. Fulfill the legacy of the legendary Dragon Riders. One thing I noticed about this movie is that compared to some failed franchise starters, like The Last Airbender, it feels a lot more forgotten, or at least not as discussed. And having watched both movies again in the past 12 months, I think it's easy to see why. Where The Last Airbender is filled with bizarre choices and memorably awful moments, Aragon just kind of feels limp. It feels like a movie written and directed by an algorithm, and I'm sure to studio executives it felt like a very safe bet. But what it ended up accomplishing, above all, is erasing any of the charm and imagination that the novel had. Don't get me wrong, Aragon the novel, in retrospect, isn't a masterpiece or anything. Like, it's mostly a fairly straightforward riff on Star Wars, told in a fantasy setting. Which is pretty understandable, considering it was written by a 15-year-old. But it's also the work of someone who cared deeply about the story he was telling, and that comes through loud and clear, even rereading it now. The movie just doesn't feel this way, and I think a large part of that is it invests so little energy into making you care about Aragon himself. While not a complex character in the first book, Christopher Polini did a great job of making you care about this guy. Taking the time to really lead you through his small village life and introducing you to people that he cares about. People like Rorin, Katrina, and Sloane. They remain a big presence in the series, but they're basically non-existent here. Sure, we at least get a scene or two with Rorin, but there's never any sense of place to where Aragon lives. It all just feels very generic fantasy farm. So when it all comes crashing down and he must abandon his home, it just feels like another boring plot point that we need to get through. Almost like the filmmaker can barely be bothered with it where the book is actually good at giving the reader a sense of this grand adventure unveiling, with everything Aragon cares about being torn away from him. The filmmaker behind the movie, Stefan Fangmir, is a successful visual effects artist, having worked on everything from Terminator 2, to Saving Private Ryan, to Game of Thrones. But this movie is the only film he directed. And it kind of feels like a movie made by someone with far more experience on the technical end of things. For the most part, the acting in this thing is just so bad. I feel like so many of the failed franchise starters of the past 20 years come back to this. Viewers just can't connect to the characters in the same way they did in the source material because the movie versions are stiff, unconvincing, and are unable to sell the emotional weight of the story. I'll just say it, Ed Spielers is terrible as Aragon. Now he's gone on to a career in things like Downton Abbey, so I'm sure he's a perfectly solid actor now, but he's in way, way over his head here. Even his reaction shots are bad, coming off as really, really over the top, like he thinks he's in an SNL sketch. Jeremy Irons is really the only standout here as Brom. Like say what you will about the cuts they made to the character's story, 
Irons is at least really, really committed to the role. His wary cynicism and dry sarcasm are probably the high point of the movie for me, as he manages to turn really basic lines into moments that actually feel genuine which no other actor in this film manages to pull off. And that includes John Malkovich as the evil King Galvatorix. He's just bad here. But a large part of that is that he doesn't need to be in this film at all. Galbatorix isn't in the first novel, he's just mentioned quite a bit. And I think that worked wonders. Like, as a kid reading it, I had really built up in my head just how terrifying this guy was. That's all lost the moment he's skulking around doing badly written Skeletor monologues. And what's worse is the time his scenes take up could have been better spent investing us more in Roran, Arya, or Murtag. Now, I will cut this movie slack in one area where the novel is just tough to adapt and that's the relationship between Sephira and Aragon. Being able to communicate solely through thoughts is something that's never going to be easy to portray on screen, and that is a large part of the book. In fact, the relationship between Aragon and his dragon is probably the best thing the series has going for it, and gives it a different flavor than Star Wars, despite the plot hitting many of the same beats. The film tries its best, and I actually think the first flight scene is one of the best in the movie, but it also has to cut down on the dialogue between the two a lot, adding Sephira to the large pile of characters who are kind of turned into shadows of themselves. Rachel Wise isn't even that bad here as Sephira, it's just that she clearly recorded her lines in a sound booth somewhere, and as a result, the performance feels really disconnected from anyone she's in a scene with. I could keep going down the line of actors who give awkward, not very good performances, because that's most of the cast. But I think you get the point, whether it's due to the director being inexperienced working with actors, or because he was just more interested in the visual effects side of things, the end result is the same. The performances in this movie are almost uniformly boring and uninspired. Jeremy Irons aside. And most of the cast has been good in other things too, so I really have to chalk this up to a problem with the direction. In the end, the movie did okay, if far from great, at the box office, grossing $249 million worldwide on a $100 million budget. And that seems pretty fitting for this one. It wasn't a success, but it also wasn't some historic bomb that went down in history. It was received around the world with one big shrug, and that's kind of all it's been since. A movie that's mostly remembered for disappointing fans of the books, if it's remembered at all. Now the novel was not a masterwork of literary fiction, but it told its story with all the excitement and passion of a young author eager to show off these characters he'd spent countless hours creating. The movie just doesn't have that. It feels like the work of people who know there's some money to be made on this property and are just using the skeleton of the story to deliver a by the numbers 2000s fantasy movie. There's nothing here. Even the charming rough edges of a book written by a teenager are gone, sanded down into something instantly forgettable. The destiny of a boy. You're the next dragon rider. The power of a friendship. You can hear my thoughts. If you decided to watch along and felt your senses being slowly dulled over the running time of Aragon, this is where I need to step in and recommend Brilliant. If you're someone who wants to learn by doing, Brilliant is for you. It teaches a broad range of subjects, not by making you memorize formulas and repeating them over and over, but by creating really engaging questions for you to use your critical thinking skills to solve. Giving you the tools to learn, but also a really fun challenge. Honestly, I was never great at math in school, but things like Brilliant's daily challenges on the app do a great job of making those concepts approachable by helping me build those skills in a way that's fun and fits into my schedule, which makes it enjoyable to learn as opposed to some crushing end of the semester exam. So to build on your knowledge and learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org midnight and sign up for free. Oh, and also, the first 200 people to go to that link in the description will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.